Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at Penn State Presbyterian. I hope everyone is staying safe and is well. Just one announcement I'd like to make this morning. Every year, Opportunity House has a big fundraiser. I don't know. Um, I'm sure you're aware of it. I don't know how many people have attended. It's called the Super Bowl, and it's an event that is combined with a lot of the schools in the county, Opportunity House, um, the Goggle Works. They make pottery bowls for this event, and then a lot of the restaurants, I think last year there were about 40-some restaurants. They've had it over at the, um, used to be the Sheraton, the Crown Plaza, for the last several years. Obviously this year they will not have the event in person, but they are having, it's called the Super Bowl Reimagined. And what they're doing this year, if you um, make a reservation, you are able to choose from the restaurants that have soup that are, they're going to be serving. And for $35, you can choose four soups. And basically, it's a drive up. They'll bring your soup and a pottery bowl out to you, to your car. So please check it out on Opportunity House's website. You can register there. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tougher for them this year, so I'm hoping that they'll have a lot of support for this event. And if we have no other announcements, we will proceed with our organ prelude. call to worship. The one who calls you together this day yearns for each of you and for all people to hear and be blessed. Speak, Speak Lord, for, for your, your servants, servants are listening. listening. Blessed is the one who comes bringing trustworthy words for the healing of the world. Speak, Speak Lord, Lord, for, for your, your servants, servants are listening. listening. Please join me in the prayer of the day. You invite us, us, O God, God to, to live, live in your, in your ways, ways, and you, you give us to each other to know and to love as we journey in this life. Show, show us your will for all creation. creation. Help, Help us to listen to your urgings with prayerful hearts so that we may honor what you have made in the name of the Holy Trinity, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Where 
the one who calls us to hear and obey already knows the confessions of our hearts and is ready to forgive. Let us forgive our sin before God and before one another. The Lord be with you and also with you. Holy God, you see into each of us and know us fully as creatures in need of your constant care. We confess that we have neither heard your word nor followed your will. We have failed our nation, neighbors, families, friends, and ourselves. Give us ears to hear your wisdom. Lead us to honesty and faith so that we may begin again with renewed strength. In Jesus' name. of those who seek forgiveness and by grace you have been saved in Jesus' name you are forgiven your sins are no more you have been made clean God strengthens you with freedom through the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus by grace we have we have been saved and we have peace with God let us share Christ's peace with one another the peace of Christ be with you and also with you Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the
As we turn to Holy Scripture, let us turn to the Holy One. O Lord, we would be like Samuel. We would be those who say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But we confess that our ears have grown dim. We are listening to so many voices, to so many words. Lord, lies portrayed as truth, hate as virtue. And so we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to hear your word. That all those other voices would be silenced, save for your own. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may hear and believe and be transformed. We ask this through Christ, the living word. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Our Psalter this morning comes from Psalm 136 verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Come now, font of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melody, some in song by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. comes from the first chapter of John, verses 43 through 51. <clears throat> the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, for the gift of your word read, we give you thanks. And now as your word is proclaimed, we pray that insofar as what is said is true, you would write it on our hearts and give us the grace to believe. And so far as it is false, may it fall to the ground, soon be forgotten, and do no harm. Amen. Holy Scripture takes us behind the scenes. It brings us to the room where it happened. In this room, we see old Eli, 
the high priest blind and asleep, a metaphor for the corruption and it, of, that had taken place because of his children and his, his inaction to do anything to stop it. Uh, in this room, we see the boy Samuel, whose name, by the way, means God heard. Samuel asleep before the door to the Holy of Holies, faithful at his post. And the lamp of God has not gone out. There is still light in the darkness. The night was dark. The sleep was deep. And God was about to, about to act in such a dramatic fa fashion that it would make the ears of the people who heard it tingle with amazement. That is the view in the room where it happened. That is what this call of Samuel looks like to Samuel and to Eli. But what about the view of the many other rooms in Shiloh? They knew Eli's sons were corrupt. They knew Eli's sons took more than their fair share and demanded more than was due. They knew that Eli's sons were using their rank as his sons to enrich themselves at the expense of the people. And they were, of course, most likely to be the next high priests. So more to come. But what could they do? Stop going to the tabernacle? That invited the wrath of God. Refused to offer a sacrifice? That risked losing God's blessing. Demand Eli's sons only take their fair share. <laughs> Who were they to tell the high priest's sons what was fair? Well, it wasn't fair. It wasn't right. The, ta the tabernacle was rotten to the core. Everybody knew it. But what could they do about it? They were on the outside looking in their room had no view. Keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, try to get through one more day. They were helpless and hopeless. Is it any wonder that, as Samuel tells us, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, visions were not widespread. Here we are nine days after the assault on the Capitol. Day by day, new details emerge about how bad that really was. Day by day, there are more arrests. Day by day, we learn the names and the stories of those who assaulted our capital. It is not easy to watch. It is hard to hear that a retired Chester fireman threw a fire extinguisher at the Capitol Police. It is hard to hear that a former Olympic swimmer was involved. It is hard to hear that police from departments across the country were involved. It is hard to hear that veterans who served our country honorably were there. It is hard to see the depth and the breadth of white supremacy in our nation. One domestic terrorist wore a hoodie with the logo Camp Auschwitz. There was a Nazi in the Capitol building. And here we sit, far from the room where it happened, with no clue as to what, if anything, any of this has to do with the work of a good God. Will America be any different tomorrow than it is today? Longing for light, we dwell in the darkness where, as Samuel said, the word of the Lord is rare in these days. Visions are not widespread. Until, without any warning, we hear, Samuel, Samuel. The poor boy must have been scared half to death. There he was, fast asleep, able to take refuge from the sacrilege all around him in pleasant dreams near the Holy of Holies until a loud voice called his name, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel had no idea who was calling him. Must be Eli. Who else could it be? Who could imagine that the creator of the universe, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the Lord of all creation, was calling a boy? A bit of comedy follows as Samuel wakes Eli up once, twice, but the third time, Eli knows something is up. So he gives Samuel's words, I invite you to include in your prayers. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel is listening and he hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that make, will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Everyone else in Shiloh slept well that night. 
no one but Samuel and Eli knew that a change was going to come. And that invites us to hope in these days of such difficulty in our nation, that in the midst of all that is ugly and brutal and hateful, God is at work. God is still in control. God is bringing good out of even evil such as this. No American witnessed to that hope, like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The 1960s saw riots born of the kind of despair that I described. And King said this, the limitation of riots, moral questions aside, is that they cannot win and their participants know it. Hence, rioting is not revolutionary, but reactionary, because it invites defeat. It involves an emotional catharsis, but it must be followed by a sense of futility. King wrote, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in moments of challenge and controversy. King wrote, never, never be afraid to do what's right especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. King wrote, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Here is where we can find hope for these days. No one in Israel saw a change coming. No one saw a corrupt religious establishment being replaced by a man who was both priest and prophet, a man who was so obedient to God that God let none of his words fall to the ground. But that's just what God did. In the same way today, we see the division, the hostility, the hate. We see the corrupting confluence of religion and politics that sends a mob on a holy war and all American jihad. Some worry that it is the end. But I wonder, could it be a new beginning? Could it be a long overdue reckoning with white supremacy and a culture where whites are treated better than people of color? And it doesn't have to be much color. Jews see swastikas painted on synagogues. Muslims endure abuse for wearing clothes as a sign of their faith. Native Americans suffer a far greater percentage of sickness and death from COVID-19 due to inadequate health care on the reservations. Asians bear the blame for the coronavirus as the China flu when they might be Korean or Japanese, but who knows, they all look the same to us. It's new for us to see this. It is not new for them to experience this. They've known this all along. People of color have endured this for centuries. But now we who are white cannot look away. We see what we can do at our worst. Now is the time for us to be at our best, to answer God's call for a reckoning with the white supremacy in our country with a resolute, here I am. Dr. King wrote, history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, written to white church leaders, King wrote, there was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Wherever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number, but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial conquest. Things are different now. 
The contemporary church is so often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century, and I would add the 21st century. I meet young people every day, King writes, whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are presently misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Samuel said, here I am, and change the nation of Israel. Martin Luther King Jr. said, here I am, and he changed the United States. Once again, the need for change is as plain as day. The need for justice, for setting wrongs to right, the need for love that overcomes evil with good, the need for hope that persists in the belief that there can be a new beginning, that hate does not have the final word. The need is as plain as day, even though the night is so very dark. But the lamp of God is still burning. Light is still shining. The voice of God continues to call us to wake up and get to work. America can change. America will change for the better. When people of God like you and like me hear the call to overcome white supremacy, to say no to hate, to say to God, here I am. Amen. Our confession of faith comes from the confession of 1967, written at the time when King was serving our country. <clears throat> Let's confess our faith together. The life, death, resurrection, and promise coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life and society and of God's victory over all wrong. <clears throat> As we come to our time of offering, again, continue to thank you for your faithfulness, for your support as we continue this ministry and we continue to seek to be a word of hope in these difficult days. So I want to thank you in advance for your generosity and for your support. And I want to invite you now to enjoy an offering for you, a minute of peace.
concerns to draw your attention to. Uh, we want to continue to hold in prayer the family of Marcia Spies, who passed away this week uh, uh, from COVID. We had her funeral here on uh, Friday. I want to remember uh, Deb and Carrie, uh, Danielle, Ben, and, and Jason in our prayers and all the family. I want to remember uh, Phyllis Spade, uh, mother of Robin and Robert, uh, Robin Durer, uh, and have an update here on her because she is also COVID positive. But she's feeling okay, Robin tells us. She is asymptomatic, and uh, she shared her phone number. So if you'd like to give her a call, please shoot a text or an email to me, and we'll be happy to, to share her phone number with you. Uh, and I know she would appreciate that, but she is, uh, again, thanks be to God, asymptomatic. I'll also ask your prayers for a seminary classmate of mine, Amy Merrill Willis. Um, her sister passed away this week, again, COVID. I just want to hold uh, them in our prayers and also want to pray for Janet Greff, who is in Reading Hospital, not COVID related. But we do want to hold her in our prayers as she is going through some treatments and possible surgery. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks that the lamp is always burning in the temple. But no matter how dark this world gets, O oh Lord, your light is still shining. Your light that overcomes the darkness. Your light that hate and evil and despair can never quench. O oh God, we thank you for light in the darkness. And we come to you, O oh Lord, with a deep sense of how dark it is in our world. Lord, first we see COVID. We pray for Phyllis and all of the folks there at the manor who are ill, we pray, Lord, your healing mercies upon them. We pray that she would come through this and be well again. We pray for her family, Lord, as this is a time of anxious watching and waiting and prayer. Oh, Lord, comfort them by your spirit. We pray, oh, Lord, for my classmate, Amy Merrill Willis, and her family as they grieve her sister, who was another death from COVID. For the family of Marcia Spies, for Deb and Danielle and Jason and all the family, Lord, as again, Marcia too has joined the ranks of those that we lost to COVID. Lord, we pray for uh, Janet Greff as she is in the hospital. We pray, Lord, your healing mercies upon her that treatment would go well and she could soon go home and be well. We pray your blessing upon her and Lord, upon all of the folks in health care who day by day answer your call, here I am put on the personal protective equipment and put their lives at risk every day. We ask your blessing upon them. We ask your blessing upon the efforts with the vaccine, O oh Lord, that it would be rolled out effectively and efficiently so that the healthcare workers could be protected and our senior citizens could be protected, Lord, our teachers could be protected, Lord, so many people who are day by day putting their lives at risk for the common good, Lord. Pray that they would be protected soon. Lord, as we think about the common good, we think about Wednesday and the inauguration. And 
all of the rumors and the fears that are out there. Fears, O oh Lord, of more hate, more violence. Fears, O oh Lord, that we will see that not only in Washington, but in Harrisburg and in state capitals all across the country, Lord, even churches. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Cleanse us from the sin of white supremacy. O oh Lord, help us all to see the ways that in what we say and in what we do, Lord, we are complicit. Lord, we take our privilege for granted. But now, O oh Lord, we see in this violence and in this hate just how ugly it is. And so we pray that there would be a great cleansing in this nation of white supremacy. Lord, that as we mobilize against Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism, so may we mobilize against white supremacy in our country. And, O oh Lord God, in your church, with the strength of his courage in the facing of this hour, O oh Lord. By your grace, redeem us. By your power, deliver us. And by your sacrifice, cleanse us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his children to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, the glory forever. Shall I 
to serve the stranger with an open mind. We are sent to serve our neighbor with an open heart. We are sent to serve our Lord, whom we will meet when we serve. As we go forth to serve, know that we do not go alone. The God of all creation goes with us, above us to watch over us, beneath us to sustain us, beside us to befriend us, behind us to defend us, before us to show us the way, and always within us, making all things, including us, new. Go in peace. Go with God. Amen. Amen.